Laudator Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. Today, Monday, March 1st, is the Feast of St. David, patron saint of Wales. And these are today's headlines. Pope Francis uh, greets the Franciscan Center for Solidarity after 30 years of service. Protesters in Armenia demand the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. And UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres calls for an investigation into last week's attack on a UN convoy in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells. Our top story today, Pope Francis on Monday met with around 50 members of the Franciscan Center for Solidarity in the Vatican's Clementine Hall. In his remarks, the Pope thanked the Florence-based center for their 30 years of service, sowing the seeds of the kingdom of God. Francesca Barro has more. Pope Francis opened his message to Florence's Franciscan Center for Solidarity on Monday by greeting their president, Maria Eugenia Ralletto. He noted that the center has, for many years, been carrying out a valuable service of listening to and being close to people who find themselves in difficult economic and social conditions. These, continued the Pope, include families facing different hardships and the elderly who need support or companionship. First of all, I would like to say thank you, said the Pope. He noted that the center is an effective work of assistance based on volunteering. In the eyes of the faith, you are amongst those who sow the seeds of the kingdom of God in a world that generates so much inequality, he added. He explained that Jesus too came into the world proclaiming the kingdom of the Father and approaching human wounds with compassion. He came especially close to the poor, to those who were marginalized and discarded, to the disheartened, the abandoned and the oppressed, said the Pope. The Pope went on to note that in its work, the centre and those who work in it are inspired by the luminous witness of St. Francis of Assisi, who practised universal brotherhood, and everywhere he sowed peace and walked beside the poor, the abandoned, the sick, the rejected, the last, he said, quoting his latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. The Pope then noted that for almost 30 years now, the centre has been following Jesus' example. This, he added, is a concrete sign of hope and also a sign of contradiction in the busy life of the city, where so many find themselves alone with their poverty and suffering. He added that it is a sign that awakens slumbering consciences and invites us to come out of indifference, to have compassion for those who are wounded, to bend down with tenderness over those crushed by the weight of life. Concluding his message, Pope Francis urged the members of the centre to go forth courageously in your work. He then prayed that the Lord sustain them, for we know that our good hearts and human strength are not enough. I am Francesca Merlo. Meanwhile, the people of Iraq are gearing up to welcome Pope Francis as he's set to make his apostolic journey to the Middle Eastern nation next weekend. His visit kicks off this Friday and lasts until the following Monday. You will see him visit the birthplace of the Patriarch Abraham and also meet with a host of interreligious leaders. The church in Iraq has been working to foster better ties in the Muslim-majority nation after decades of conflict, including the recent insurgency of the so-called Islamic State. One example of these efforts is the project officer of Catholic Relief Services, Hassan Amir Abdullah. Mr. Amir, a Muslim working for a Catholic aid agency, spoke with Devin Watkins about his hopes for Pope Francis's upcoming visit. The Pope visit to all the religious and the political leaders of Iraq remind us that all people should work together and gather these efforts uh, for a common goal, which is peace. I would also like to highlight that visit is going to be a historical visit for the first time in the Iraqi history that we have this visit from the Pope Francis that that will also open the international community eyes on the Iraqi community in general and to know the context very well in Iraq. And all of the communities here in Iraq, they're very looking forward to this visit that will also be a hope, a message for hope and solidarity and peace for the Iraqi community. How are relations between Christians and Muslims currently, especially given the conflicts of the past couple decades? The Christians are, and the Muslims are now rebuilding trust between them as a result of the, um, the conflict and the use of displacement. 
the, the operation itself is still ongoing. We have seen many initiatives from different religions and communities here in Iraq to come together and also to promote reconciliation and peace. But uh, to be honest, we need to keep it working. We need, as a, an agency and other organizations, we need to keep working on uh, fostering this uh, relationship building here in Iraq. And uh, as a Muslim, I work at the Catholic Relief Services with colleagues of different faith uh, to contribute to restoring peace and rebuilding trust between uh, groups like Muslims, regardless of their ethnicities, and Christians, regardless of their ethnicities. In our project, uh, we empower youth to uh, work with uh, people from different religions uh, to uh, to define uh, together the uh, vision for their community and the future for their for their children, for their relatives. And that was Hassan Amir Abdullah, the Project Officer of Catholic Relief Services. He was speaking with Devin Watkins. Turning now to world news, political tensions in Armenia escalated Monday with supporters of the embattled prime minister and the opposition organizing massive competing rallies in the capital. Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has faced opposition demands to resign after he signed a peace deal in November that ended six weeks of intense fighting with Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Stefan Boss reports that demonstrators also entered a government building. Outnumbered guards watch as demonstrators burst into a government building in Armenia's capital, Yerevan. Dozens of activists are walking and shouting in the complex. These protesters want Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan to step down immediately. Critics blame him for Armenia's defeat by neighboring Azerbaijan in the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh last year. An opposition activist makes clear that the break-in showed that they could get into any government building. The complex houses several ministries. He and others are furious that the Prime Minister accepted a Russia-brokered peace deal that ended the deadliest clashes in years between forces loyal to mainly Christian Armenia and heavily Muslim Azerbaijan. The conflict reportedly killed more than 5,000 soldiers as well as civilians. During six weeks of fighting late in 2020, Azerbaijan recaptured areas around the enclave. It also took the key town of Shusha inside it. Under the Russian broker deal that emerged shortly afterward, Azerbaijan kept the areas it captured. And hundreds of Russian peacekeepers are in the disputed area to monitor a tense peace. Amid the turmoil over his policies, Prime Minister Pashinyan warned of an attempted military coup against a democratically elected government. Supporters of the Prime Minister and his opponent planned massive rival rallies in Yerevan on Monday. Another sign that the tensions in Armenia are far from over. For Vatican News, I am Stefan Bus, reporting. Elsewhere, the UN Secretary General says the United Nations supports an investigation into last week's attack in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on a UN agency convoy that left three people dead, including the Italian ambassador to the DRC. Linda Bordoni has the latest. Italian ambassador Luca Attanasio, his bodyguard, and a World Food Programme driver died during an attack on their convoy on the 22nd of February in eastern DRC's North Kivu province. WFP is the food assistance branch of the United Nations, and the attack happened as the ambassador was on his way to visit a school feeding project in the area. In an interview with the Italian newspaper La Stampa, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres confirmed that an in-depth security review of the incident is ongoing and that the UN is working hand-in-hand -hand with both the Congolese and Italian authorities as they conduct criminal investigations to ensure that those responsible for this crime are brought to justice. Guterres went on to address many other issues in the interview, including the need for reform in the United Nations, as mentioned by Pope Francis in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti. 
expressing his belief that the UN is the only organization that can help to bring all nations together to deal with major threats. He said he agrees there is a need for reform and reiterated the need for a multilateralism based on the current reality. The UN Secretary General also spoke of the need for an equitable distribution of anti-COVID vaccines and a concrete commitment by all to grapple with climate change. Looking ahead to the next COP26 summit in Glasgow in November, he said this year is going to be a make or break year to confront the global climate emergency. This is the time, he said, to raise ambition across the board in mitigation, but also in adaptation and finance. Finally, the UN Secretary General addressed the issue of migration and the newly released Pact on Migration and Asylum. In line with Pope Francis, he upheld the need for all states, whether receiving or transit countries or countries of origin, to ensure that refugees and migrants are treated with respect for their safety and their dignity. Overall, he said, migration must be seen and managed as a net positive for economies and societies, both in terms of countries of origin and countries of destination. I'm Linda Bordoni. And finally, the Pope Emeritus, Benedict, has granted an interview to Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera as the world marks the eighth anniversary of his renunciation of the papacy. In remarks published on Monday, Benedict says he made the difficult decision to resign in full conscience and that he believes it was the right choice. Father Benedict Maiocchi has the story. On the 28th of February 2013, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's announcement of his resignation from the papacy became effective. Eight years after, he recalls that it was a difficult choice but made in full conscience, a choice which he insists he has not regretted at all. In an interview with Italian newspaper Correria della Sera, the Pope Emeritus stands behind his decision, hoping to dismiss the viewpoints of some who continue to see conspiracy theories behind his decision to leave the chair of St. Peter by retiring for reasons of old age. He remembers that it was a difficult decision, but he made it in full conscience, and he believes that he did well. He added that he is thinking about the conspiracy theories that followed his decision to renounce the papacy, including those who said it was because of the Vatilic scandal and those who said it was because of the case of the conservative Lefebrian theologian Richard Williamson. He noted that some do not want to believe it was a conscious decision, but his conscience is clear. During the course of the interview also, the Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI spoke about Pope Francis's upcoming apostolic journey to Iraq. In this regard, he said that he thinks it is a very important trip, unfortunately coming at a difficult time because of the unstable situation in Iraq and also because of the COVID-19 pandemic. He however promises to accompany Pope Francis with his prayers. I'm Father Benedict Mayaki. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Vatican and World News. For more on these and other stories, and to hear this broadcast as a podcast, you can visit our web portal at www.vaticannews.va. You can also catch the latest updates on our Facebook page and on Twitter. Many thanks this afternoon go to our technicians in studio. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells.